Welcome to House of History. During the Second World War, the Japanese had quite a different war ethos than the Allied powers and even their own allies, such as the Germans and Italians. During the late stages of the war, they deployed so-called kamikaze pilots, pilots that mobilized their aircraft as a weapon and crashed into enemy ships and targets. So where exactly did the term kamikaze come from and what is the story behind these pilots? As for the origins of the word kamikaze, there is actually a very long historical tradition of the word. It refers to a mythical divine wind that supposedly blew over Japan centuries ago. According to this tale, this divine wind protected the island when during the 13th century, the Mongols tried to invade it with boats. The grandson of Genghis Khan, Kublai Khan, attempted to invade the island twice with a massive fleet. These invasions failed because a typhoon destroyed the majority of the Mongol fleet. These storms were called kamikaze and served an important role in later history when explaining the failed Mongol invasions. Now, during the Second World War, the Japanese army command reasoned that just like the divine wind that repelled the Mongols, the Japanese kamikaze pilots would fight the US ships. Now, using kamikaze pilots wasn't a familiar tactic at the beginning of the war. As a matter of fact, it wasn't until late 1944 that the Japanese high command even considered the idea of utilizing kamikaze pilots. This idea of sacrificing oneself in such a way for the emperor and empire wasn't completely new, though. Before the first kamikaze attack, for example, the Second World War had already seen banzai charges, Japanese soldiers and sometimes even civilians that charged at their enemy, sometimes with bombs strapped to their chest, sometimes just with weaponry. They preferred death over capture by US troops. Japanese propaganda played an important role as well. Japanese soldiers were told horror stories about the treatment of POWs by US soldiers, which led them to think death was the least painful and most honorable way to go out. Yet, as the war progressed, Japan suffered material and resource shortages. By late 1944, the Japanese high command considered an American invasion on the mainland to be a serious threat, if not inevitable. By October 1944, the recently appointed commander of the 1st Air Fleet, Takijiro Onishi, started to test the waters with other commanders about a new strategy. In his opinion, it was the only strategy that could win Japan the war, or at least prolong it, use pilots that would suicidally charge into US ships with their specifically designed aircraft, including attached bombs. Now, initially, some commanders accepted his plan, but there certainly was resistance among both the top Navy and Army commanders. As internal discussions went on, though, several high-ranking officers felt there was no time to waste. Disregarding the fact kamikaze was not yet an official strategy, Rear Admiral Masafumi Abrima decided to organize his own kamikaze mission. On the 15th of October 1944, he became Japan's first kamikaze pilot. He used his Mitsubishi G4M twin-engine bomber and supposedly flew into the aircraft carrier USS Franklin. Although sources are conflicting on whether Masafumi actually reached the USS Franklin or he crashed beforehand, what is certain is that the carrier suffered considerable damage. Regardless of whether the kamikaze attack was successful, it became a massive propaganda tool for Japanese media and the military, and Masafumi was credited with being Japan's first kamikaze pilot. Following this attack, Onishi established the first suicide brigade, the Tokotai, an abbreviation of the Japanese term of special attack unit. It earned Onishi the dubious nickname Father of the Kamikaze. But the term Kamikaze was only used informally and only after the term gained popularity abroad did it become a commonly accepted term in Japan. The brigades were formed on the Malabaka airbase in the Philippines. When the concept was relayed to the local squadron commanders, it is said they received it in a frenzy of enthusiasm and happiness. In short, Japanese soldiers received the order to die for their fatherland. Now, I mentioned the first unofficial kamikaze mission by Masafumi, but the first official kamikaze attack is much better documented. The photograph you're seeing right now is of the men of the first of three kamikaze units having a ceremonial toast of water as a farewell. 23-year-old Lieutenant Yuki Oseki led the squadron. It consisted of five Mitsubishi Zeros, each carrying a 250 kilo bomb with the mission to fly it into US aircraft carriers during the Battle of Light Gulf. The goal of the mission was to paralyze the United States fleet for at least a week for the Japanese fleet to prevent a US landing on the mainland. 
The mission, however, wasn't a success. It wasn't like the earlier mission because the pilots missed their targets. All five planes actually crashed into U.S. carriers and they even sank the USS St. Lowe, killing 143 of its crew. But the damage on other U.S. carriers didn't cause too much disruption and at most delayed the U.S. fleet for several days. Even though the mission cannot be considered the staggering success the Japanese military command hoped for, Vice Admiral Onishi and the Japanese propaganda machine welcomed it as if it was an unprecedented victory. They broadly publicized about the courage of kamikaze pilots. And due to this propaganda storm, both the military and Japanese public started to see kamikaze missions as a necessity for the war effort. That goes for all those Japanese soldiers that literally fought to the last man. There are so many accounts of battles for islands in the Pacific where thousands of Japanese soldiers were killed and only a dozen captured. One of the reasons was the military code from 1872 stating that soldiers that surrendered or fled should be killed. But there is a deeper collective psychological reason for this notion as well. It was the heritage of the feudal samurai culture and the tradition of Bushido and Harakiri. Committing suicide was seen as a sign of personal courage. During those last couple of months of the war, Japanese kamikaze pilots managed to sink 34 United States ships and aircraft carriers and seriously damaged hundreds of others. A common myth is that these kamikaze pilots willingly carried out their missions. And while some pilots certainly jumped at the opportunity to sacrifice their life for the emperor, anthropologists and historians dispute this claim. The social pressure these pilots suffered was incredibly extreme. Japanese anthropologist Onuki Tierney refuses the myth of voluntary sacrifice among pilots. One of the key differences was that traditional harakiri was an individual decision, but at the same time kamikaze pilots, they were selected in groups, and if you didn't want to go on the mission, you'd have to withdraw in front of all your peers. As you can imagine, the peer pressure was immense, and those that did refuse their assignments, they were often sent to the deadliest fronts where one would near certainly perish. The initial kamikaze missions were carried out with Japanese Mitsubishi fighter planes, but soon the Japanese developed the Yokosuka MXY-7 Oka, a human-guided kamikaze attack aircraft. On the aircraft, the cherry blossom was painted, a symbol used to stoke militarism and nationalism among the populace. These aircraft were specifically designed for suicide attack missions. And as for the composition of kamikaze units, well, it had some very telling statistics. Over 75% were young men, most of them in their late teens and early 20s. In total, well over 3,800 Japanese pilots ended up dying in kamikaze attacks. Around 1,000 of these were young men that had just graduated university and were promptly selected to join a kamikaze unit. No high-ranking officers were recruited and no descendants of prominent Japanese families either. But that is not to say high-ranking Japanese officers didn't join kamikaze missions. The first unofficial mission, for example, was carried out by a rear admiral. And the last attack, which I made a separate video about, was carried out by another admiral. Kamikaze missions initially remained small in scale. The Battle of Okinawa in June 1945 saw the first mass use of kamikaze pilots. During this battle, one of the bloodiest of the entire war in the Pacific, over 1,500 kamikaze attacks were registered. The incredible bloody battle led to between 77 and 110,000 killed Japanese soldiers and Okinawan conscripts. Yet it was not for another two months until the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki that Japan finally surrendered. The day after Japan surrendered, Takejiro Onishi committed ritual suicide, seppuku, and wrote a letter in which he apologized for the deaths of around 4,000 pilots he had sent on kamikaze missions. He included a poem that read, Refreshed. I feel like the clear moon after a storm. He then slit his abdomen with his sword and stabbed himself in the chest. After the war, one of Onishi's subordinates wrote a classic book called The Divine Wind, in which he called the use of kamikaze pilots unforgivable. In 1975, the Chiron Peace Museum for kamikaze pilots was built. It is built on the site of the airbase at Chiron, where hundreds of kamikaze pilots took off for their final flight during the last stages of the war. Now, if you're interested in more stories about kamikaze pilots, there will be some end cards on screen about both the story of the last Japanese kamikaze attacks and the incredible tragic story of First Lieutenant Hajime Fuji, a man whose family literally sacrificed themselves so he would not be held back in performing his perceived duty of carrying out a kamikaze attack. Thank you very much for watching this video.
I would also like to thank all my patrons for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and want to support my work, consider checking me out on Patreon. For just $1 a month, you will gain access to the exclusive Patreon series. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.